Good afternoon and welcome to the 29th annual exhibit of hydrogen fuel cell technologies. Uh, there are hostesses that are going to bring drinks around. Um, it's a busy day. This is the second of the elevator pitches. You kind of wonder, what is an elevator pitch? Well, some of you have heard the door of the elevator opens, you start talking as quickly as you can, and the doors close on you after, what, three minutes, five minutes at the longest, and then we have this a nasty lady with an umbrella who chases the uh, people off the stage. So three to five minutes, hopefully three minutes for each presentation. Presentation of what? Uh, when I started here 20 years ago, you could rarely find anyone talking about electrolysis. Why? I think most of you know in the industry, where did we get our hydrogen from? Ah, oh, steam reforming, natural gas, sometimes it's a byproduct from the industries, but largely electrolysis was not discussed here. And then suddenly you look at the changes. Now, the number of square meters occupied by the electrolysis industry out here, it's like number one. It is the most important factor in this revolution towards net zero. These gentlemen here are going to save the world, I keep saying, but the changes that are necessary in order to transition to net zero are just massive. And uh, we need presentations of this technology. Of course, right now, the business models are various. So you will see people talking about very specific applications, people who work um, small scale, but also large scale applications. Sometimes, of course, one has to think about the business model they have now. The business model they have now is very, very key to making this industry survive. But the growth of this industry is something that I find fascinating, and also the outlook for this industry, how quick this industry has to grow. This is the industrial revolution that is going to take place. Everything else will follow. When hydrogen becomes affordable and it's a renewable resource, we have to find ways to consume it. And by the way, renewable energy, we cap the production of renewable energy because we cannot store it. We'll hear this in the discussion. Is there any way to store renewable energy large scale without hydrogen right now? All the physicists say no. You can't pop, pump water uphill. There's not enough hills with lakes on top in Germany. There's just no options right now. So it really is hydrogen production and storage for large scale use of renewable energy. I could talk for hours on this. I'm going to cut myself off right now and introduce the first speaker of a total of seven. It's Benoit Barrier, who's chef technology officer at McPhee Energy, an old friend of ours. Welcome, Benoit. Hello? Yes, good. Good afternoon. Um, what are the building blocks for McPhee to produce green hydrogen? First, what is McPhee? McPhee is the leading low carbon hydrogen equipment manufacturer. We pr produce electrolyzers. I will speak about it. And we produce also single and dual pressure high flow refilling stations for the markets of industry, mobility, energy. McPhee is organized around four locations. The technology center in Berlin area for the electrolyzers, the plant in Italy to produce the electrolyzers. In Grenoble, we have a plant to manufacture the refilling stations and a technology team. And what we are building in Belfort is a gigafactory where we will produce our next generation electrolyzers. We are more than 250, uh, more than 20 nationalities, and a strong focus on engineering, obviously. So to make a focus on electrolyzers, you all know that it's composed of stacks and electrolyzer processing units. We have built our range of product around the powers of two. So. For example, the electrolyzer processing units are going from 1 megawatt, 2 megawatts, 4 megawatts, 16 megawatts. The next generation is 16 megawatts that will be built in Belfort starting to, uh, 2024. For the stacks, it's 0.5 megawatt, 1 megawatt, and 4 megawatts for the next generation. We have done this path in 10 years. We have quite a lot of experience. and. 
as you understood, our next building block is composed of four times four megawatt stacks working with a 16 megawatt EPU. What are the specificities of McPhee electrolyzers? First, we have 10 years of experience in ASOPS, so we are able to build some safe designs that's of utmost importance. We have developed the zero gap technology for electrode for higher energy efficiency. We are building stacks of high pressure. It allows to have smaller piping for the EPU, a smaller footprint, and it's suitable for most applications. A high current density, which saves also footprint for the stack. And last but not least, we are using polymer frames instead of metallic frames. That makes lighter stacks better to uh, transport, maintain, and especially to follow the load, the electrical load, so for the ups and downs of the electrical load. You all know, like me, that what counts is the leverage cost of hydrogen. And to compute this leverage cost of hydrogen, there are several factors. Obviously, the cost of the stack, that will be the capex of the project, but also the energy efficiency and the degradation rate. There's not only one degradation rate, there are several ones. It all depends on the load that you have. Is it constant? Do you have ups and downs? That makes different degradation rates. So what we build is not a one stack that fits for all purposes. It's a fit for purpose that we design with the project owner. And for that, we are developing technology, obviously, but also, that is very important, manufacturability of the stacks, standardization, that's of utmost importance, as well as services. Services, that's one of the answer if a stack goes wrong, to be able to replace it quite easily. To finish, McPhee is on the move, it's expanding. We have 20 megawatt of operation in Q3, two plants, as I told you, one gigafactory, which will be ready Q1 of next year. Testing capa capabilities will be multiplied by five next year. And we have built a partnership uh, out of Europe, so we are going out of Europe, with India, I mean, a partnership in India with Larson and Tubro, as well as in the Gulf countries. Uh, our headcount is growing quite fast, plus 50% last year, plus 50% is forecast for this year, so it's time to join us if you wish. And to exchange on all that, we, I propose you to meet at 5 p.m. at our booth C56 for a beer. Thank you very much. So up next, oh, so up next on the stage is Carsten Krause, Managing Director at Elogen. Uh, yeah, Carsten, you have the stage. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, in the next minutes, I will explain uh, you about our strategy for the sustainable world and what is a part of uh, Elogen. So. Now it works. Okay, so first I want to, to introduce uh, Elogen. So we have a new shareholder, maybe we, uh, some, some of you uh, know us as Arriva H2Gen. Now we are proud to be part of the GTT group. So they entered in 2020. Uh, so 100% uh, of the chairs are GTT. GTT is uh, the main player for the LNG storage in containment ships. And uh, it's very important um, to understand that now we have the same DNA for like, like GTT. This means we have a very strong focus on, on R&D and innovation. And as GTT is doing this for the LNG storage, we are very focused on, on the stack. But I come to this later. So a few key figures about our company. So even with Elogen and new name, we have uh, for two years now. Uh, it's a company with uh, more than 15 years of experience, French-based company. Our headquarters is in Paris. 
Greater Paris. So we delivered electrolyzer already in three continents. Today we have almost 100 uh, employees. And uh, yeah, our goal is to go for one gigawatt electrolyzer capacity in uh, 2030. The concept of Elogen is maybe something, some different uh, to others. So the heart of, the, of our strategy of our company are the stacks. So we, we have a very strong R&D, as I mentioned. We go for the manufacturing, for the assembly, and for the testing. So the stack for us, it's the main, main part of the electrolyzer. It's the heart. And then we have uh, two lines. So we have container uh, electrolyzer systems, where we go for 5 megawatt, 1 megawatt, 2.5, 5 megawatt, or even multiply to 10, 15, 20. And if you go to large scale applications, we go together with an, an EPC. Uh, and we are more focused on, on the stacks. Today we have the production of the, of the stacks in Les Olis, in, in, it's in Greater Paris. And uh, yeah, we are also very proud that we signed the, the contracts for, for an IPSI project. It's a gigafactory. And this means uh, we, yeah, we already started. And in 25, we are, we are ready to present this gigafactory where we have the capacity of one gigawatt uh, minimum a year, or not minimum, but uh, it's for one shift. And we, in this IPSI also, it's a very strong part for the R&D. And for this gigafactory, it's based in Vendôme, in the heart of, of France. And uh, through the support from the French government and, and, and in, within this IPSI project, yeah, we are happy to, to develop this project to be ready for the, for the market uh, in the next years. Performance is very important, I guess, even because we have the focus on the stack, performance. And here you see efficiency, aging, flexibility. These are the main, main parts in our innovation strategy and also in the production strategy. So we developed a system, so as I mentioned, one megawatt, 2.5, and this is our flagship, the open power system, five megawatt. You can multiply to 10, 15, or 20 megawatt. Um, here you can see, you can see it also on our booth, we have a, a model there. So it's all included, it's very small footprint and, and even very efficient. Um, ah. Ah, now it works. Yes, so the first, uh, oh, no, not, well, not the first, but <laughs> the last uh, project for this open power solution is uh, the customer's Enatrack. So we sold uh, two of these systems as a 10 megawatt uh, solution. So going, to going for green hydrogen in, in Eastern Germany. And also I want to mention that we are very, we have due to the GTT group, which is in the maritime sector, we have a very strong focus even on offshore solutions. And the latest uh, deal we have is with, uh, with a shale daughter or with a joint venture of shale and Eneco with Crosswind. We have this 2.5 uh, megawatt solution within a project. Um, yeah, going to be decentralized on a, on a windmill. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carsten. Up next on stage is Mortimer Schulz, Business Development Manager at GFH2. Welcome, Mortimer. Hello. My name is Mortimer. I'm coming from the company GF. No, this is not my presentation. GF Hydrogen Europe, GmbH, located in Frankfurt. And uh, our mother company is Chinese, Guofu. That's the, what the GF stands for. It's in Jiangsu province. I'm introducing our electrolyzer as well as several other products. So we start in the value chain of the hydrogen with the electrolyzer. We have PEM electrolyzers starting at four norm cubic meter output and uh, going up and then the alkaline electrolyzer from 200 norm cubic meter output. What you see here, this stack is a 1000 norm cubic meter output. Pressure can be up to 25 bar. It's coming out. And I'd like to refer to this picture on this side. Same stack. 1,000 norm cubic meters, that one over there. Next to it, it's also our product. We make the, we build the separation uh, of the gas and the liquid ourselves. 
and also the purification unit, trial, we produce that ourselves as well. Gives us more certainty about uh, whether we're going to get the things delivered and reduces our lead time. And uh, there are a few other products I'd like to introduce as well, which we also do ourselves. So we actually pretty much do most of the things ourselves and produce them. We have storage tanks, gases form, liquid form, and also those that are mounted on trucks, on the side, on the back. So we also transport the hydrogen. This is all still the GF, the Guofu Hydrogen Energy Equipment Company. And we build our own filling stations because when we propose to the customer that you can produce your own hydrogen, hopefully in a green way, then you also got to do something with the hydrogen. One of the ways is probably to add a filling station. And all the components you see there, pretty much all the components, it's all our own product. So we are the complete system deliverer, producer. And here are some examples. So anyone got an idea how many hydrogen stations we've got in Europe? One number? Something like... 150 or 200 or so. In China, there are 300 filling stations, hydrogen refueling stations. 110 of these 300 have been delivered by us, Kuofu Hydrogen. And uh, mostly these are supplying, these are catering for buses as well as also for trucks. Now, what I've shown you with the range of products starting with the electrolyzer was from the production. We produce that, storage, transport, and also the application. We have sister companies within our group who produce fuel cells, different kinds, and other components as well that go into the fuel cell system of the car. And this is already my last slide. Here you see once again the name, Jiangsu. I'll just go back to this one. Jiangsu is this, where Shanghai is here, Jiangsu is this province, and then there's the city of Suzhou. That's where we are. So the so name is of our mother company in China is Jiangsu Gofu Hydrogen Energy Equipment. And just for short, it's GF, Hydrogen Europe GmbH in Frankfurt. And this is probably a picture you've seen, uh, this type of picture several times. Um, our background, the background of our founders is in the gas business and where many of the components have always been produced themselves and then coming from the LNG. Moving on to the hydrogen, it is also the philosophy of our company, of our group of companies, to have this holistic approach that we are actually uh, the equipment producer across the whole broadband. And what I haven't mentioned yet, we also have a stand. We're at the public forum over there, and the stand number is D32, Delta 32. I invite you, please come over, pick up one of the brochures, talk to us, get a name card, get a coffee, or any inspiration any question uh, that, that you might like to ask, please hop over. <laughs> Thank you very much. So rolling right along, <laughs> next up on the stage is Magnus Thomason, who's co-founder of CPO High Star. Welcome, Magnus. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Magnus Thomassen, and I'm the Chief Product Officer of Highstar. Uh, just to remind everyone, our challenge and our common challenge is that we need more than 3,000 gigawatts of installed electrolyzer capacity in 2050. That means more than 100 gigawatts of electrolyzers being installed every year from now and 25 years ahead of us. And then we will almost reach that goal. And this is a joint uh, effort that we need to be able to handle this uh, challenge. The other challenge that we need to do this uh, cost efficiently so that we can produce hydrogen at two euros per kilogram or even lower. And that is really why I, together with my colleagues, started Highstar to contribute to this challenge. Uh, what we can contribute with is our uh, patented solution for PEM electrolyzers. It is uh, a new way of operating permanent electrolyzers that increase the performance and the efficiency of these units uh, by changing the operating conditions. Uh, it uh, improves the performance by reducing the membrane thickness, 
but it also gives additional benefits when it comes to safety and also manufacturability of these units. So I'll get back to that. If you know, want to know more about the technology, I won't go into detail, but you're welcome over to our stand just under uh, lucky number 13 uh, if you want to know more about our technology and our products. So the effects of this uh, change of uh, operating conditions is uh, a reduced ohmic resistance in your cells. And you see this on a polarization curve, which I hope that a lot of you are uh, familiar with. But it uh, reduces the ohmic resistance, meaning that we can uh, push more current through uh, at the same energy consumption, or we can reduce the energy consumption uh, significantly. So uh, approximately 10% more efficient than uh, comparable PEM electrolyzers today. Or we can run at the same efficiency, but at higher current density, meaning we can produce more hydrogen with the same st stack size. We are utilizing these uh, this performance to uh, market two different uh, products targeted at two different types of, uh, let's say, projects. One for grid-connected uh, electrolyzers where the uh, electricity price is high and that is the main driver for your uh, cost of hydrogen. That is our Vega platform or the Mira platform, which is more connected to uh, intermittent power supplies, the power sources, where you have lower cost, but fewer operating hours per year. And then it's the CapEx, which is a cost driver, and uh, the Mira ones is a more affordable uh, system with higher uh, hydrogen production capacity. Um, we are developing also, as everybody else, solutions for large-scale applications. We are st standardizing one stack platform. It's about 750 kilowatts in size. Uh, it is designed for mass manufacturing, not uh, increasing the size too much, but to make sure that we can produce it, uh, this at scale. These are combined into modules of 2 to 3 megawatts, which either is used in our containerized solutions or also can be offered for EPC contractors in large plants from 100 megawatts and upwards to gigawatts. Uh, if you want to know more about our systems and if you want to have a virtual tour of a plant like, uh, like this, you can come over to our stand and we'll have a VR show of, of that afterwards or tomorrow as well. Uh, and I also mentioned the stack assembly capacity. As I said, we need 3,600 gigawatts of electrolyzers. It's important that we are able to scale this fast. And it is important that these stacks are actually possible to manufacture uh, in an automated assembly uh, at scale. So we are now at a manual assembly level, but we are planning to uh, install a gigawatt assembly line uh, in 2026 that will, from the beginning, be able to produce more than one gigawatt of stacks per year, scaling up to, to uh, multiples of that towards 2030. If you want to uh, work with us or work uh, uh, for us, we are located in uh, Oslo, outside uh, the capital of Norway, uh, close to the Nor uh, Oslo Fjord. Uh, here we have our headquarters, we have our innovation center, and this is also where we will have our gigawatt assembly line uh, from 2026. Uh, I can probably the only beachfront uh, assembly plant for electrolyzers in the world, uh, and it's a beautiful place to be. So with that, I would like to thank you, everyone, for the attention. And as I said, our uh, booth is just under the 13 number over there, and uh, we'll welcome to meet all of you there afterwards. So thank you very much. So thank you. Um, see if we're ready for the slides. Up next on the stage is uh, Saro Capozzoli, who's co-founder and director of H2 Energy. Saro, welcome back. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's an honor to be again here, the second year for us. Last year, we had uh, here in, uh, in this place exactly the one megawatt uh, PEM electrolyzer. We took here a 40 feet container. And uh, this year, um, we wanted to bring here the new technology, but we'll be ready uh, by the end uh, of this year. But I will tell you something more in this, uh, in this uh, uh, speech. Um, we are a relatively young company, but with uh, a team that has a long experience between 20 to 40 years experience in the sector. 
the uh, human resource for us uh, is the most important valuable uh, asset for our, our company. Uh, in fact, in the short time, uh, we, are, we were able to uh, produce already our first electrolyzer. And, we are, and uh, this year, we have uh, a capability to uh, produce between 20 to 30 megawatt. And next year, we, we are going to double this uh, capacity. Um, actually, we are um, in, uh, in, um, uh, we, we were born during the COVID period. And, uh, and we were really able to organize a production in Italy, utilizing all, most of the uh, Italian components, Italian technologies uh, all together. And uh, in, uh, our, in our program, there is uh, the um, already planned uh, a, a factory to be uh, starting at the end of next year for about 70,000 square meter in north of Italy. Um, we are a producer of alkaline systems with our own design. Uh, we are going to, with our lab, uh, research and develop lab, uh, we are going to produce uh, our own uh, stack uh, with uh, membrane alkaline system. And uh, we, are, we are pushing uh, in a direction to produce alkaline at 100 bar. This is our, our target. Uh, in this moment, we are at uh, um, a, normal, a normal pressure of 30 bar. We produce also PEM system, the traditional PM system. And uh, the news that we bring to the market this year uh, will be the single stack 200 kilowatt anionic membrane solid electrolyzer. It's a new technology where we don't change, we have not only developed a new membrane, a new catalyst system, but also new design, a physical design of the stack that will change completely the, um, the technology and the, the way to produce um, uh, hydrogen. Um, this uh, system will be already in October, and we are going now to do the certification, and uh, uh, the minimum module will be 200 uh, kilowatt, but by the end of the year, we will be able to produce uh, one megawatt stack, single stack, uh, single stack in, uh, in, uh, in that will, be, will take the best combination of the two previous technology. Flexibility and also a better and cheaper price for the, for the system, because we don't need uh, precious metal, and at the same time, we have also flexibility in the operation. This is the news that we are bringing to the market. Um, actually, uh, the, the system is, uh, some pro patents are still under, uh, under process, so I cannot tell too much about this system, but uh, with this will be a game changer that will go together with the production of the other system that we are in the pipeline. Uh, this is uh, our, this is in Hanover last year, is uh, our uh, uh, megawatt uh, PEM. Um, this was our first experience, but uh, um, this year we are already in uh, under production um, uh, a system for other 15 megawatt. I know that uh, we are with our com colleague and uh, competitor and friends, uh, we are speaking about a huge uh, quantity, huge uh, production capability. Uh, I believe that uh, more or less, more, all, almost all of us, we are at the same level, we can say, in, with a big market, with the limited actual uh, capability to produce. What we need to do now is uh, to, uh, to speak about the real number is possible to do in the market, because we have, uh, as everyone, problem in uh, um, acquisition of components and uh, the production capability can be on the paper big, but we need to face uh, about the, pro the pro problem with the, the supply of uh, components. For this, uh, when we simplify the system, this is our aim, uh, we can even be faster in also to do automatic process for the assembly of the stack. This is what is our target next year. We are working in this direction. This is uh, our plant that uh, uh, in the future, you can, in our boot here in the corner, uh, you can see a digital twin where we can walk inside the, uh, the, 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 the plant. So this is very elevated speech. I'm very fast and 
I don't want to bother you more fruitfully. If you have any question, I will be in the corner there, and uh, I hope that we can uh, cooperate uh, um, in the future. Thank you very much. So, up next on the stage, we have another uh, company and corporation that's been here several times, uh, Ruben Fury, Business Development at Enaptor. Welcome, Ruben. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so today, I'll be presenting you Enaptor. So basically, we are a highly vertically integrated AEM manufacturing um, company. We focus on our core technology, which is the AEM technology. I will tell you in a moment uh, about it. But basically, we focus on scalable and high manufacturability um, products. And we have a, we have a high, um, uh, basically, we, We've been funded in 2017, and uh, since then we've sold thousands of our units. So basically, we are we we don't just make claims; we are based on uh, on facts. We have a, a production capacity right now in Italy, where we are pumping out stacks every uh, month, and we have uh, thousands of units on the ground at the moment. We are expanding our production capacity here in Germany, um, and right now we are about 250 people working from Germany and Italy. And um, yeah, our main goal is to bring down the cost of hydrogen with our low-cost AEM technology. Um, so far, um, our systems have been used and are in use around the world. Uh, and what you can see here on the screen are our modular one kilogram per day systems. And they can be integrated into larger systems. And this have very short lead time. We don't just talk about gigawatt systems in 2050, we deliver systems now. So every company that wants to get started with hydrogen, we can give you a system in two, four weeks time. That's right, we can manufacture and deliver real AEM systems right now. Um, and we have a track record, as I said, um, and millions of hours of operation on the ground, which really gives us an advantage. Our AEM technology, as I said, is highly vertically integrated. We do most of the components in-house. We fully control the, um, the technology and the, uh, the, sorry, the electrolyzer around it. Um, you can think of AEM like the best of PEM and uh, alkaline technology. It's sort of an alkaline technology with a, with a membrane, basically. Um, so we have the low cost of alkaline systems, not using any rare metal like uh, titanium or iridium, uh, but with the performance benefits of PEM systems. So we have high purity of hydrogen, high pressure of hydrogen, and high dynamic uh, performance uh, so that you can actually produce real green hydrogen, not just fake hydrogen like you actually cannot produce green hydrogen in alkaline systems because you need um, constant energy, which actually renewable power doesn't give you constant energy. So with, with the AM systems, you can really uh, produce cost-effective hydrogen um, by, by, by using the excess power of renewable energies. Um, and yeah, our um, technology is special. That's why also we are famous, but our product approach is also what differentiates us the most. We have a, a modular and scalable uh, approach to the market. Everything, all our products are based on one standardized, highly mass manufacturable stack module, uh, which is right now in production. And that basically goes into both, sorry, both our, um, our product lines. Um, the first one on, on the top, it's one kilogram per day, and then you can modularize that into up to 40, 50 kilogram per day systems. And then what you see on the bottom is our newest solution. It's the multi-core. So basically, we take many stacks, we put them in series, we centralize the balance of stack, and then we have a much larger system using the basic building block, like you would do for an electric car, for example. You have many batteries in series. So that's what we do to make manufacturing easier and to scale faster towards larger systems. Uh, right now, we have real systems on the ground working at the moment. Uh, what you can see here, just a few examples, uh, power to power applications in Germany or in the Netherlands. Um, you, can, you can check them out in our website. We have much more information. Drop by our uh, booth, we can tell you more, but just to show you. Um, and for example, biomethane, uh, our systems are very 
flexible, so you can just integrate them into standardized cabinets and, and reach your desired hydrogen production goal. Um, we've also uh, cracked the market with our megawatt scale systems. We really uh, have planned deliveries for 2023 and 2024 um, for, for multiple megawatts, um, and this is definitely going to be a milestone for an after going forward. Um, this is our factory in Pisa, in Italy. We just expanded to the building number four. Uh, here we are producing our stacks, and we will keep growing this facility where our core and R&D production is, is taking place. Uh, moreover, everybody's talking about gigawatt and scaling. We actually already have a factory almost done. Here we will produce uh, megawatt scale systems based in Germany. And going to the end, this production is going to be 100% off-grid and uh, coming from renewable power. So we actually make green uh, hydrogen production machines using green electricity, which, of course, makes sense if you want to industrialize um, towards transitioning the economy. Um, so basically, the three things I want to tell you today are, uh, are this. We can deliver scalable systems fast and at low cost now. So you don't have to wait two years. You don't have to spend millions of euros to get your hydrogen business going. Uh, get in touch with an after. We can get you started with hydrogen at low cost now. So thanks for listening, and uh, I'll hope to see you at the booth. <laughs> I love the applause. <laughs> Okay, up next on stage, uh, Tristram Kretschmer, who's Director of Sales and Market Development at Plug Power. Welcome back, Tristram. Thank you very much. Guten Tag, everyone. My name is Tristram Kretschmer. I'm Director for Sales and Market Development at Plug. Plug is a PEM electrolyzer manufacturer, but we are also so much more. In fact, we built up the very first hydrogen ecosystem in the US. We start with our own hydrogen sourcing over transportation, storage handling, liquefaction, down to utilizing our own hydrogen in our own fuel cells at client sites. But let's focus on the electrolysis for today. Two years ago, we launched our product line based on modules to serve a very wide range of applications and industries. 1 megawatt, 5 megawatts, couple of tens, up to 100 megawatt plus large plant capacities with different model approaches. It was two years ago. One year ago, we announced that we're going to mass produce our systems and also our stacks. And this year, I'm happy to announce that we keep our promises. That means what you see here is our beautiful Gigafactory in Rochester, New York. We don't have a beach like Highstar has. We have the Niagara Falls next to it. Maybe that keeps up a little bit. But anyways, we are producing automated our one megawatt stacks in that factory. In fact, this first quarter, we announced that we produced 122 megawatts stacks in that factory. And we are on track to meet the 100 megawatts per month by the mid of this year. This is fantastic news for the stacks. And of course, we also have fantastic news for the systems, because we currently have a significant amount of systems under production. And here you see a couple of them. We produce our modules for our own sites to produce green hydrogen and bring it to the market, but of course also for our clients and partners. We have shovel-ready designs for large-scale applications, and we even have one floating around in the Atlantic Ocean, as you see here. So those are real construction sites. Those are real projects that are underway. And we can do that because we have the necessary capacity to do that and we have a global project execution team that supports us. Hydrogen is part of our DNA. Uh, we want to change the world to the better, and we want to do this with partners, and we want to create even more hydrogen and green ecosystems. So we're more than happy to support you with your endeavors. Just hit us up, go to our website, go to our booth. Um, looking forward to engage with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I really did the three minutes. <laughs> you did it, you did it, wow. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. I would like to ask all of the uh, members of this uh, elevator pitch to join me on stage. Uh, here's where the debate and the discussion begins. Um, there are f other microphones there. Feel free to grab one on the way here. Um, they get passed back and forth. Um, 
it's almost an embarrassment to ask people to participate in this. All of these people have um, business contracts to sign and other things here. And as I say, it's a lot of real estate on the stage. Um, it's very difficult to know where to start with questions, too. I will open this up to the audience, but I wanted to start with a few questions. Uh, question number one is really the success story. Um, uh, uh, let's talk about an after. Uh, I love the, the applause from the corner here. Years ago, the first time I encountered the company was the presentation of Atea Cohen here, uh, and it was the AEM technology. It was a very small unit, and there was a remote application uh, the engineer's dream, of course, of uh, supplying some remote region with um, electricity. It could be a house on a mountain, for example, and you have the production through solar panels of electrical energy, you have electrolysis, you have a storage tank, and you have on-demand energy through a PEM cell. Um, uh, this was before you moved to Berlin, <laughs> before you expanded. This is exponential growth. This is what it looks like, isn't it? Right. So this is actually what we aim for, right? We have the technology, and as everybody here, we want to scale, and we want to make impact. So we have the technology that allows us to grow fast and to use uh, materials which are available and that don't have supply chain constraints. Um, so we want to leverage that and, and go forward and build lots and lots of electrolyzers, and that's how you make it cheaper. So of course, the market is also going towards megawatt scale, so we will respond to that and, and try to serve it as best as we can. Mm -hmm. There's so much detail to discuss here, and I don't know where to begin with some of these things, but another exponential growth factor was simply, well, we need to test the things that we're building. So uh, a max, uh, an increase of, a uh, five-fold increase, uh, Benoit, of testing facilities, you discussed that briefly in your presentation. We're still developing this technology. Um, are we keeping up with the development of the technology? It is evolving slightly, Electrolysis has been around since, what, 1838? Um, and it's still improving. Oh, can we keep up with the development, or are things changing slowly and just the manufacturing capacity has to increase? No, it, it continues to evolve, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Even though we would like to finish a product, we still see hundreds of improvements, and it comes from our customers, from the continuous run that we have and that give us ideas of improvement. So definitely we need more testing capabilities to integrate all these improvements. Again, we are uh, in a technology that keeps improving. <laughs> I see that. Uh, Carlo, it looks like, sorry, I should ask a question. <laughs> Hidden at the end of the line there. Um, I've had a lot of conversations about this megawatt. It's a wonderful term, isn't it? Um, uh, on the application side, there is a PEM cell, uh, or a PEM stack, I should say. Um, uh, stacks, I think everyone knows what they are, but they're just basically piles of plates. They're called a stack. Uh, you can combine them to create larger scale, or you can create a stack that is large. There is a one megawatt uh, PEM cell now, and they uh, believe that saving weight is one of the uh, factors for creating this for aviation, for example. You don't need the humidifiers and blowers uh, several times over, you service one thing. The one megawatt single stack is, I think, what I heard from you. Am I mistaken here? Are we increasing the size of the individual stacks rather than um, using modules and piling them one on top of the other? But for what concerns the PEM, I think uh, the one megawatt is a, a standard now. We, we look for to increase the size of the, our new technology, the ionic membrane solid electrolyzer, from 200 kilowatt, 500, and from one in two or three years, we can reach even five megawatt single stack. But this is, we need the first testing, test the, uh, the one megawatt one. So the, of course, for alkaline, traditional alkaline, it is no problem to go to five megawatt. No, this is a, is a very well, uh, established technology. So this is, we are, because uh, as I say, if we, we, we were obliged to change completely also the design, the internal design of the stack to reach, uh, to start from the two kilowatt to the 200 kilowatt stack. So, so this is a big challenge for us, but we are, uh, we are, uh, our uh, aim is to, uh, to increase the, the, the size, yes, of course. 
Uh, I love numbers because they give us an idea of where we're going. Um, Magnus, you mentioned 3,600 gigawatts. The end goal, is this 2050 or 20, 2050? Okay, so this is what we need to actually uh, reach carbon zero. Uh, we know when we discuss technology, sometimes there's this sort of, okay, it's nice to have electric cars, uh, but what about um, do we have enough batteries for electric cars? And when people start doing the math about that, they say, you know, mining for the next 360 years before we actually have enough batteries to convert every single vehicle in Europe and the rest of the world to electric battery-operated cars. Uh, materials and their availability are important. Now, here is the question that has always interested me. I've always forgotten to ask this. Of course, in all of this technology, there are things like precious metals. Um, there is... Uh, 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 and I'm, I don't want to talk about expense, simply materials. Um, do we have the materials in order to expand, even if we throw money at this issue and up the manufacturing scale, do, are the materials really easily solvable? Is there enough materials around uh, to create 3,600 gigawatts of electrolysis? If you use the um, materials that we use today, in the amounts that we use today, I would say there are some uh, bottlenecks that need to be, uh, be solved. But uh, as uh, one of my colleagues said as well, there, there are, we, it's continuously improving, right? It's continuously uh, changing, and we see there's a huge opportunity to thrift noble metals, to, re to go for... Uh, different kinds of uh, construction materials, going away from titanium to steel, uh, changing from PFSA materials to other materials in the in the towards 2030, 2040. Uh, so I wouldn't say that it's a showstopper. It's a challenge that all of us has to uh, be able to solve together to be to get there. But uh, we will be able to reach those goals if all of us work together to do, solve it. Yeah. Uh, Carsten. See it in the same way. So, if we do not anything today, we will have a bottleneck. Yes, uh, but uh, I can say from from our point of view. So we are strongly, um, yeah, developing also new or in, in the kinds of catalysts or as you said, uh, the, the raw materials. So I guess to to reduce it dramatically on one hand, also in parallel working on solutions for recycling. So this is very important. So even in, in, in our part for the, the R&D part for the Giga factory, it's a strong part. And so we have to do it from, from our point of view because we will have the bottleneck. And on the other hand, we have to do it because in terms of regulation. So we are all working together in, uh, within Hydrogen Europe in working groups together with, uh, with uh, regulation from, from, from Europe to reduce all this uh, raw material. So it's, I guess it's, it's strongly on the way. And so, in that time, we are, we are working all together <laughs> to focus on that. Tristan. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I completely agree. I mean, we have to strive more or less for a circular economy. This is the way forward. Uh, we also do some testing. I mean, Plug has acquired Gina ELX, who has been building electrolyzer stacks for almost 50 years. So we, we know exactly what happens in the stack and how much raw materials you need and how much you can stretch that. So we know by recycling the stacks, and this applies for uh, almost every technology, if you recycle the stacks in 10 years, you most likely can equip five to 10 stacks with the recycled material you get from the, from the precious metals out of the old stacks in, 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 this, in this new, let's say, batch. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we already have a large acceleration and a huge potential to solve that. I'm not certain about 3,600 gigawatts. Uh, I'm not retired in 2050. This is going to be a huge issue, but it's also, I mean, we still can sell them. That's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Right, I'd like just, just like to add in my master thesis I wrote one time when I did an ecological analysis that about 50% of the fuel cell could be recycled back. Doesn't matter which materials now and then whether it's the fuel cell or the electrolyzer. Let's just call it a number. I think in the future, I mean, uh, mankind, womankind, we have always been uh, exploiting our resources in our uh, planet. And that will never change. It's just depending which technology and which process we will do less harm but it, it will never be completely. And, and we will go for one technology for as long as that resource is there. And then, then when that resource is depleted, we will go for the next technology. And I'm just saying this, uh, I would like to remind, we have six different types of electrolysis where we're using two mainly PEM, 
alkaline, and then AEM3. So actually, uh, the, the, the materials will also uh, keep ever changing, and then we might have to discard one technology of electrolysis, but doesn't mean we're going to give up electrolysis, we just adapt. And this is what we always do <laughs> and always will do. Uh, Ruben? Yeah. <clears throat> so this might be a bit provocatory, but that's what we're here for. So um, you could argue that if a technology is not ready now to solve the problems that we have now, then it's not the right technology. So we basically would, should put our money on solving uh, the problems that we have now. And at the moment, we need to reduce our carbon footprint. We need to decouple from fossil fuels. And if that means um, b doing damage on the other side of the coin, then to me, that's not a real solution. So I think a lot of players already are also looking at how to reduce these materials. But if you can avoid using them all at once, then you have an, a clear advantage. That's why we're not the only company looking at AEM systems. Actually, everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people, a lot of companies are looking into reducing or removing those materials in the first place. So that's one really key aspect, I think, that should not be forgotten about PEM systems. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I noticed that carefully no one mentioned where the bottleneck is. Um, so uh, there are actually a couple dozen, I know they're there, the commodities experts who want to buy options for various commodities here. What exactly are the materials that we may run short of? Because obviously their price is going to go up and I want to buy futures on those, I'll tell you. What are the materials? Come on, who's going to reveal? Who's the physicist here who's going to say, well, it's going to be... No? <laughs> That's mainly we talk about platinum and iridium, mm -hmm. uh, which are the precious metals we, we, we talk about. But from our internal analysis, and we have a dedicated team that's been working on nothing else but on analyzing the market and also the future to avoid a bottleneck and run into the dilemma in the next 10 years, uh, we are quite relaxed. We don't see that this becomes an issue because we take care of those, let's say, future challenges and also the production capacity, the global production capacity within its planetary boundaries is capable to serve that market in order to um, yeah, well, free us from fossils. Uh, we went through this cycle with PEM cells. They also use precious metals. And as soon as the volumes went up, uh, it became an issue recycling. Can you recover 80% or 90%? That was the big issue. Go ahead. Uh, yes, we can, uh, or we don't recycle it. It are, it's our subcontractors that do that, but the uh, recycling rates of 90% and plus is a f totally feasible work for iridium and platinum. And it's much, actually much higher for hydrogen technologies than it is for, for auto catalysts or things like that, especially for electrolyzers, because this is a closed loop. It doesn't disappear into you know, private uh, people uh, ending up somewhere in uh, Africa or something. It's, it it go, comes back to the manufacturer and comes back to the supplier of the precious metals. And it's a huge, it's a very uh, high cost, and it's Im important to keep it within the uh, cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Uh, when it comes to the, the CO2 footprint of materials and so on, I don't want to comment on that now. I think that the, all the technologies are have their footprint, and we could get somebody to do a comparative life cycle analysis if you'd like to do that. But there is always a footprint, and we need to minimize that for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important that we work together and solve the issue, which is really fossil fuels, and reduce that as fast as possible. Uh, Benoit? Yes, it's, it's on. Just one last word on iridium and platinum. Uh, if despite the efforts of all the industry, uh, one day uh, the world is falling short of such elements, uh, let's be clear, the alkaline electrolysis technology doesn't use any platinum and iridium, so still can be a solution. Okay, so it not, it's not necessary for oh. electrolysis. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, coming back to your question about uh, recycling, so even for us, if we are focused on our own recycling process, so we are really open uh, and, and we are going together with partners for, for new uh, yeah, uh, methods to, to, to recycle uh, PEM stacks. And I guess in, in terms of recycling, we are just at the beginning. So I guess in the next, next even next three, five years, they, they, will, they will be developed a few more 
uh, methods to, to recycle the PEM stacks and we, are, we achieve even, even higher quantities. Uh, the, the awareness of how um, important uh, these precious metals are is obvious in Berlin, where you've just moved, you've got a, uh, a unit of your company in Berlin. Uh, what I mean by that is you, if you happen to park your car somewhere, uh, you come back occasionally and you start it up and it's really loud all of a sudden because someone stole your catalytic converter. This is a sport in Berlin. It happens all the time. It's happened to my girlfriend twice. It really is a problem. So, and it's because of the value of those catalytic converters. Uh, they are worth so much, worth more sometimes than the used vehicle they're in. <laughs> so it, it really is kind of humorous. Uh, what is less humorous is, um, uh, of course, what affects the price of hydrogen is the price of the energy, isn't it? And uh, people debate about efficiencies and cost per kilogram. Um, all of these things are important here. The, like this price of $2 a kilogram, it used to be, or two uh, euros, well, it's almost the same right now, okay. It used to be, we have to get $5 per kilogram. Uh, the issue that one has to have with this, of course, is um, uh, we used to name prices in order to compete with fossil fuels. I remember uh, uh, when Nell, uh, a few years ago for the first time, uh, Björn Sorensen, Nell was yesterday on the elevator pitches, what did he say? We can achieve fossil fuel parity. And the idea behind that is with uh, a lot of renewable energies and with the effectivity of the electrolyzers, we can actually compete dollar per dollar for, for the cost of energy. Um, that is wonderful, of course. What is more important is we're doing something else, though, with this industry. Really, we're facing the problem of energy security. Those of you who are in Germany right now, living in Germany right now, have seen the effect of weaponizing hydrocarbons. There's no polite way to put it. Uh, one country can cut off the gas to try and threaten a government into cooperating with its foreign policy, it's so obvious, and this is what dependence on one source of hydrocarbons can do uh, to a civilization, to the European Union. This is very important. Oh, you're nodding your head. I noticed um, that China is wise enough not to buy too much from the country I'm referring to. They want to diversify their supply. Well, what is interesting about hydrogen, hydrogen is not going to be simply produced in Germany. It's going to be a diversified supply chain. I've already mentioned we can't produce enough hydrogen here to service the European industrial complex. It has to come from somewhere else. It's going to be a diversified supply. This raises the question, though, the business model right now in Europe is large, isn't it? But the business model where we have to develop electrolysis in cooperation with renewable energies across Africa, in Australia, wherever solar power is abundant. And we already know from other people we can convert that to easily transportable uh, um, uh, alternatives, ammonia, uh, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, if we want to, or you're, you're going to interrupt me Was there me a question? Here. No, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go ahead. No, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I, I think there's several levels you, you just tackled, yeah. and I totally agree with you what you said, 100%. What I do not agree with is this two euro per kilogram debate and statement, because what it says is that we always have to compete with something that we cannot compete with because it's unfair and it's based on wrong assumptions. Because in those two, two euro a kilogram, we must consider that the cost for environmental damage is not considered. It's not in there. And we must face the situation that it might become simply more expensive in the future to produce hydrogen. And the electrolyzer manufacturers, everyone who's standing here, can sell electrolyzers at a certain price, which is the capex. And we all know that the typical calculation says capex has a certain impact of x, y, z. But the main driver comes from renewables. So we need renewable energy, cheap renewable energy, to be, let's say, comparable. In that, in that matter. So that's number one. And number two is, of course, you, you will not be able to produce all the hydrogen in Germany that you need for, for Germany. And this is, this is something which I also don't really understand in the, in the debate, because what we, what we forget is that we never produce 100% of our own energy, never. We always have been importers, we always have been traders, and this will also become a global trademark. It will become a, co a global commodity. This is what we need. And this, of course, starts with affordable, renewable energy. Plug is building their own electrolyzers to produce hydrogen for our own fuel cell systems and fuel cell clients. 
So we have dedicated teams working just on power purchase agreements. So we know quite well how challenging this could be, but that there's also a way out to make it happen. Yeah, well, this is part of the, I, I agree with you, of course. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is, and I agree, we should not be trying to compete with fossil fuels, but right now, at least in Germany for the time being, um, uh, this business of fossil fuel parity, oh, you know, if you have the ideal system, we're beyond that right now. That is not the issue. The issue is we don't have enough renewables. Uh, the issue is that we are curtailing the supply of renewable energy. We're turning off wind turbines simply because we haven't stored the energy. And what all of these gentlemen know on the stage is there is no feasible way of s storing um, 3,600 gigawatts. When I say storing, we all know a lot of people use um, uh, natural gas to heat their homes. One third of the natural gas goes into heating domestic apartments, right? Well, what that means, of course, is you need a supply that uh, is enough to get you through the winter just in case something happens. The storage facility, I don't know how many terawatts and gigawatts that is, but it's a massive quantity, far larger than the electrical grid, which is only 15% of the energy consumed if you look at how it's delivered. So uh, we need to address this larger quantity. We need supply chains. We need to be all over the world where their renewable energy is available. By the way, this is another question then. Uh, if, you, if you think there may be bottlenecks in the production of hydrogen through electrolysis, what about, are there bottlenecks in the material sciences for the production of renewable energy? How many solar panels can we produce? How many wind turbines? What issues are there there? Does anyone know the answer to that question? I'd like to uh, maybe go comment a bit on this renewables and how much and so on. I think it's a very important point that electrolyzers and uh, renewables, they are synergetic. So to be able to move to a, a community or a system with a very, very high uh, share of renewables, you need to have some kind of flexible either generation or, uh, or power use. And electrolyzers are very good at doing that. So uh, by implementing and, and building electrolyzer capacity, you can also make it more or easier to actually increase the production of renewable power. So that's one thing. And even uh, you know, in a country like Norway, where 100% of uh, electricity is renewable, so we don't need to go off-grid to be renewable in our production, uh, it's still a matter of fact that we need this kind of electrolyzers capacity to, to be able to introduce even more renewables. Just because it's difficult to have an uh, ideal copper plate with uh, with uh, electricity grids serving all the needs at all times. Mm -hmm. So this is an important part of the question. When it comes to the materials use and the challenges when it comes to renewables, I think we might want to have some other experts to comment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, it's a common challenge for all of us. We need to transition from a fossil source of energy that has been functioning well for us for uh, 50 years or 100 years into something that's sustainable and will bring us to a thousand years into the future. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone on the stage who hasn't experienced exponential growth? That is like a doubling of the business model? <laughs> is, is it a question that makes everyone uncomfortable. So, no. <laughs> so I, well, um, what we like to say at Black is we operate in dog years, which says we, what others do in seven, we do in one. And this is actually true. So I, yeah, I think now is the time. Now is the time, and the, the, the ball is rolling for hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Sir? No, just some words about uh, yeah. um, what is our philosophy. I think um, that uh, as is, is true. It's difficult to imagine a thousand, thousand kilometers, square kilometer of solar panel. Or I think the way that we need to be convinced is the nuclear power we need to rethink about our strategy. We need to re, re, come back to our decision, especially in Italy, that we say no to nuclear. We need to, to think about how to re, return to the safe re nuclear. Second, second is uh, we, believe, we do believe that we need not to transport hydrogen, but to transport energy. Then to use, to produce hydrogen where it's necessary, where it's needed, in the airport, in the port, in the stations, where the industrial parks, in order to, they, they localize the production. 
this is our view, because to think to produce one gigawatt uh, production in one location, we have a huge problem of uh, storage, transportation. Storage, for me, is the weak point of all the chain, because it's too expensive, and there is no real solution. I don't know. I think this will be something we need to think about, address. Mm -hmm. So this is my, my, my our view. Echo. So for this, uh, we believe more in the, in the 20, 30 megawatt plants rather than the 100, 200 megawatt plants and then to create more problems for the transportation. Mm -hmm. So this is a... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe to add something also about this uh, renewable. So I think it's important to, to have this view, like, like we mentioned, so the big, big numbers from 2030 and 2050. But I guess it's also very important to act, to act now. So, so this means to have these projects today and tomorrow and the next year and, and uh, in, in two years. So even to learn to get from, from, from the size of the electrolyzer bigger and bigger, to connect it with, with wind or solar or renewables from hydropower, and to learn, to learn with, uh, with this connection, to learn in, 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 in the sizing of the electrolyzer. And I guess I hope that, that we get the regulation in, in, in Europe now and also in Germany to, to, to go forward for this really important next step. So it's, it's, it's good to, to talk about the, the vision, but even I guess uh, all, all we, we electrolyzer manufacturer need, need to act now and bring in the electrolyzer into the market, have projects to learn and, and to act and, and to scale up. Mm -hmm. Do we have questions from the audience? Everyone is still shy. Well, um, uh, uh, to, to conclude with a few applications, of course, I love this global look at things, uh, but a business model doesn't start with the perspective of 2050, of course. Um, you people have things to do. There are clients out there. Uh, you mentioned, uh, for example, Mortimer, uh, that you do filling stations. Um, just a reference to how that is operating. Of course, each individual country has really its own specific issues with traffic. Um, there are cities where the fine particulate matter in the air is so high, like in Berlin occasionally, you can call up the mayor and complain, and theoretically, after a certain number of days, he has to shut traffic down. Uh, so they have to get away from diesel, diesel vehicles. Uh, there are areas in the States I've heard of where uh, during the pandemic, 30% of the food Uber Eats ever used it. 30% of the food was delivered using hydrogen powered cars. <laughs> so there's absurd little things happening. What's happening with the fuel systems in Ch China? How is that uh, industry growing? I will, I, I will say it like this. First of all, by background, I'm half German, half Chinese. Uh -huh. And I take neither side. It's uh, that I'm now working for a Chinese company, so I'll represent the view of the company, of course, and what I've been told, because I haven't been to China myself, <laughs> is um, it's actually on a governmental level, the decision that we need fuel cell buses, hydrogen buses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the rollout for the filling stations and the buses is there. And the technology may have been in cooperation with, with other companies before and then continuously developed in centers as well. So you also can scale. And where these 12,000 buses come from and, and, and 300 stations, it's not like when we're talking about filling stations now, to take that example that you mentioned in your question, uh, here, in, here in Europe, we're talking a lot about the cars, the hydrogen cars for the filling stations. And then now, uh, now that we've deployed a number of filling stations in the European space for cars, we're looking at trucks. Mm -hmm. We're looking at buses. Mm -hmm. We're looking at trains. Mm -hmm. Well, in China, we've got the buses, the trucks, and the trains. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you're a car, like I love driving hydrogen myself, <laughs> um, I was told, hey, when you come with your hydrogen car in China, they send you away because the bus has priority. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. this says something about the national importance. While I think if I may compare between cultures that uh, in, in, in Europe or in Germany, uh, the, the, it's, it's not necessarily coming from the, from the top, from the governmental level. So that's why uh, you'll have a municipality, you'll have a, 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 a communal government or the city who do the efforts, who do the initiative to, to start a project. And then there's uh, EU funding being discussed. So there's a company like H2 Mobility who says, okay, we'll, fill, we'll build the filling station. Give us the business case, which city... Uh, which county uh, would like a filling station? Okay, we'll build one. We'll also build the 350 bar. Mm -hmm. 
So um, th that, of course, takes a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Also, if the thought in the end is, is, is the same, of course, that we have to switch to, to different means and we don't want to stick to the combustion engine with, with the exhaust. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. It's just yes. to give it a very uh, a d a diplomatic, a very light flavor of uh, how, how uh, you know, the Chinese approach could, could be viewed. Mm -hmm. I, I would quickly like to comment on this. So refueling is surely an interesting use case. But for us also, what's very interesting at the moment is decarbonizing industry. So a lot of industrial players are using tons and tons and tons of natural gas at the moment. Of course, you cannot substitute that uh, like in one day or one month. But something that is really interesting, at least from an after side, is to quickly deploy a electrolyzer on site, which can provide a blend of natural gas and hydrogen and already reduce the carbon emissions and, and make the end user comfortable with using hydrogen and making them comfortable that their machines support hydrogen so that they can scale up in the future. So we actually aim at tackling the small scale problem right now, even though we know that in the, in the, in the future we will need to substitute all of that hydrogen, which we, uh, all of that natural gas, which will require much, much more electrolysis. But yeah, that industrial use case is, is definitely an interesting one. That was actually my next question. Who's, wh whose company has a lot of clients who want to decarbonize their industry? It's not transportation. It's a, yeah, does anyone have a, test, a, a case scenario that is interesting that they want to talk about? Would you like to describe where uh, uh, hydrogen plays a role in decarbonizing the industry and who your clients are? Um, clearly, the experience of McPhee is that the driver is the decarbonization of the industry. Mm -hmm. Mobility is important, but the real driver today is the decarbonization of the industry uh, with methanol production, with ammonia production, with cement production. We have different business cases, uh, refineries that want to have green hydrogen instead of gray hydrogen. So we have all sorts of cases, but definitely there's a lot of carbon oxide, uh, dioxide uh, emissions to save by, I mean, using green hydrogen instead of gray hydrogen in the industry. Did you want to add a case scenario of uh, decarbonization? Yeah, I just want to mention, I, it's, uh, we cannot uh, discuss our clients directly, but uh, for example, in uh, high, high heat in industry, and we're talking about, let's say, we're thinking about ammonia and steel and so on, but also uh, whiskey distilleries. <laughs> so that's a good thing, right? Uh, go and buy green whiskey, that's important, right? Because they, some are, they are using fossil fuels as well to, uh, in their distilleries. So, uh, there will be potential for green hydrogen using for whiskey as well. Saro. Yes, you know, Italy is famous for the food processing, you know, and we have a lot of projects in the food industry. Pasta maker use a lot of steam. <laughs> Cheese, milk manufacturer. So we are working a lot on this. We have to reduce, to cut down the consumption of methane. Uh, this is, uh, so very soon we will have uh, a green pasta, green, a hydrogen taste pasta, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, it, but also, you know, we, we forget one thing, that uh, in the, our system, of course, all of us, you know, we produce also oxygen. Oxygen is used for the clean water treatment, for the, for the diary, you know, for milk production, and they need uh, also to clean. So we have uh, also to find application for oxygen, otherwise it's a waste. You know? This is very important, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are, are we done with comments here? Is there anything we should add? Just the oxygen fraction over here. Okay. And the pasta noodle is, of course, the best energy storage, the carbohydrate. <laughs> you eat it and then you've got energy. <laughs> yes, yes. And we did have a whiskey tasting yesterday, and uh, they referred to the carbon balance of the producers. So. Uh, Yes, even in Scotland, they take this seriously. I would like to thank my guests for their patience and reward them right now with a beer for uh, going through this ordeal. It is a long time to remain standing, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's exhausting. Uh, but it's worthwhile to have this conversation. Uh, I love the idea behind this. It really is necessary to get this discussion going because it shows, it illustrates the immense vitality of this industry, but also its importance for our future. So thank you, uh, Benoit Barrier, 
Meyer, Carsten Krause, Mortimer Schulz, Magnus Thomasen, uh, Salo Capozzoli, Ruben Furi, and Tristan Kretschmar. Thank you all. And thank you to you as well. We've been watching you for many years. It's always <laughs> a pleasure you. to listen to you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. See you next year. Yeah. Yes.